constrained in the course of interpretation. And I do mean in the time course of interpretation. And there are two questions central to linguistic pragmatics, at least two, but these two certainly are. And I take linguistic pragmatics to be the study of how context influences interpretation. The first is, what is the character and role of context in interpretation? And the second, what part do non-linguistic inferential processes play in interpretation, especially in filling the gap between explicit content, sometimes called what is said or the truth conditional content of the utterance, and what a speaker evidently means? So I'm saying this filling the gap is about determining the assertion intended in uttering an indicative utterance. And we're going to focus mainly on the target utterances will be mostly indicative here, although that's ultimately a mistake. That's all we have time for today. The classical answers to question one, uh, principally due to David Kaplan and to Robert Stalnicker, both assume that context is static. It's fixed at the outset of interpretation, and um, Kaplan's context is a simple tuple of values for speaker, place, time, and world of utterance. Those are intended to take care of the indexicals, like I, here, now, and actually. Stalnicker's context is the interlocutor's common ground, a set of propositions, or a, a set of worlds compatible with those propositions. And they play a role in resolving conventionally triggered presuppositions, uh, uh, resolving con contextually triggered presuppositions generally. Not just anaphoric and indexical ones, but a wide variety of uh, presuppositions. So one might understand context on either of these two accounts as merely setting a few parameters so that composition yields the utterance's truth conditional content. The classical answer to two what part does, do non-linguistic inferential processes play in interpretation, derives from Grice, um, in, and this is that uh, pragmatic reasoning takes place strictly after compositional interpretation has determined what is said. So call this, I actually dubbed this thing, I'm terrible about this, icing on the cake. This, I, because you bake your propositional cake, maybe just a little input to fix the values of some indexicals, but not much from context. You bake that cake and then you ice it with some additional inferences that you draw on the basis of that conventional content and the Gricean maxims, that, some of which Elizabeth just introduced you to. Now there's some alternatives to the icing on the cake view. Both Sperber and Wilson and their theory of relevance, which is not my notion of relevance, and Francois Recanati offer an alternative and let's call this the Wild West account also dub, I'm making a lot of enemies, yeah. Uh, wherein free pragmatic inferencing takes place at any point in interpretation, yeah? Um, in contrast to both those views, um, Ernie Lepore and Matthew Stone, Matthew's here, let's hear from him later, have argued in a recent book, I think that should be 2015, right, that Gricean inferences play no important role in interpretation. Not that you don't do any inferencing in the course of taking into consideration what somebody must have meant on, on the basis of the context, but that isn't essential to grasping what is said or what is meant in the linguistic sense. So I'm going to offer some linguistic evidence that argues against the classical uh, answers to both these questions, as well as against an extreme version of Lepore and Stone's story and the Wild West approach. So this is an alternative to all of these alternatives, as well as the classical view. And then I'm going to sketch a conception of context that contrasts with that in all the accounts that I've alluded to above, in that it is both dynamic rather than static, and is constituted by a body of information that's structured by the interlocutor's evident goals and intentions. So there's an intentional structure over the, the information that the interlocutors share and take to be the context of utterance. Don't worry too much about what that is. I'll try to give you a feeling for that. But that's unlike any of the other notions of context. Just a set of tuples or a set of propositions. Sperber and Wilson deny that there's a common ground that plays a role, et cetera. So I'm going to give you some examples, and I'm actually going to spend the most time on these because I think they help give you a feel for the kinds of things that are at issue. And besides, I'm a linguist and I like data. 
Um, first, we have a business traveler, A, in Los Angeles, early in the morning, is talking with her travel agent, B. A says, it's urgent that I get to a meeting in San Francisco by late this afternoon, but now it seems that my flight may be canceled. B says, if the flight gets canceled, rent a car. Since you're in a rush, you might request that they put a radar detector on the dashboard. The highway patrol is always setting up speed tracks on tra traps on Route 101. Okay? You got the utterance? Everybody okay with that? Any infelicity or in trouble understanding? Nary a bit. We? Oui? Okay. No? Whichever one I'm supposed to say in French. So there's some features of interest in one that I want to bring to your attention. And I've color coded them for ease. First, rent a car in B1 carries an intrusive enrichment implicature. That's what Mandy Simons calls it in an important paper on this phenomenon. It makes B1 mean something like, if the flight is canceled, rent a car in order to drive to San Francisco. Is that the reading you understood? OK. The implication that the rental is for the purpose of traveling to San Francisco is part of the consequent of a conditional, and hence, it's part of the proposition expressed by the conditional. It's, you can't take the proposition expressed and then ice it with some glycine cake. There's no layers you can put it in between, OK? <laughs> Neither the antecedent nor the consequent is a proposition expressed. And that's the respect in which this is an intrusive implicature, yeah? That it crucially is introduced after the introduction, on the basis of the antecedent, plus the content and the consequent, and it has to play a role in the truth conditions of the conditional. So that's a problem for the icing on the cake view. The domain of the modal might, green-coded there, in B2, is implicitly restricted to range over circumstances in which what? Not just that you're in a rush. That's really not the point, is it? That we know. That's in the common ground. Do you, is the agent suggesting that uh, A, is A should um, request a radar detector in any case? No. Only in case the flight gets canceled and she decides to rent a car. Correct? I hope that's the reading almost all or all of you got. Right. OK. So that reading, which means if the flight gets canceled and you rent a car, one conceivable path is requesting that they, presumably the car rental company, put a radar detector on the dashboard. Hmm? That's the reading you get. That's called modal subordination. I made that term up, too. I'm the terminology lady. OK. So note that even after the suggested context in B1, which is if the flight gets canceled, rent a car, um, the, the the, this domain restriction or modal subordination interpretation of might is not inevitable. So it's not that B1 was just the most recent utterance, hence the most salient, so you use those uh, irrealis clauses to restrict the domain of might. No. So I can, for example, instead, right after B1, if the flight gets canceled, rent a car, B could have said B2 prime. Since you're a platinum frequent flyer, you might request that they reroute you through Las Vegas. Okay with that? Okay. Now, that doesn't uh, relativize the scope of might to rental of a car. Do you understand that? In fact, it's an alternative to the suggestion that A, rent a car. Now, of course, we're still talking about what might occur if the flight gets canceled. This is not come what, way that you, come what may that you get rerouted through Vegas. But what aspects of B1 one understands to be used to restrict the domain of might and hence affect the truth conditions of B2 is a function of pragmatic factors that you have to figure out as the addressee. And I think none of you had any trouble doing that. I expect that B2 prime is OK with everybody. And so you see my point. Even after B1, it's not inevitable that you use that rental of the car as part of the restriction on might. OK? OK. So, um, in the, furthermore, the dashboard in B2, that they put a radar detector on the dashboard, is understood to be anaphoric to what? What dashboard are we talking about? 
The dashboard, she was always quick, hand up. The dashboard of the car, right? Okay, so what car? What car? Is there any particular car under discussion here? Oh no, no. All we have is the arbitrary car that could get rented in some given possible world or other in which the flight gets canceled, yes? And A chooses that path. So this, and, and moreover, um, the dashboard doesn't say the dashboard of the car. This is what's called bridging an aphora. It's not a co-referential relationship between the dashboard and the car. Rather, the salience of this, in this case, arbitrary car, um, suggests and makes it available. I could have referred to uh, on its dashboard if I wanted to explicitly, okay? And then we take dashboard relationally to mean dashboard of X, and that's the anaphoric relation, okay? You have to figure out the relationship between dashboard and some salient entity. Here, a discourse reference for the arbitrary car, all right? So, this is bridging an aphora. I'm, uh, Clark is the person who made something of this, and it's a very important uh, observation about the discourse here. Finally, as if that weren't enough for one poor little example, three, B3, the highway patrol is always setting up speed traps on Route 101. Why does B say that? <laughs> well, I mean, it's not just like a non sequitur here, right? It's not like, oh, I just threw in the interesting bit of information that the highway patrol sets up speed traps. No. In this particular case, I'm probably suggesting that that's the explanation for why I propose that should you rent a car, you ask for a dashboard uh, radar detector. Got it? Those are illegal in Ohio. Don't do it. But I don't know about Ohio, uh, uh, California. Okay? So here's these four things, none of them explicit, right? All of them, you've got this intrusive implicature, you've got this modal subordination, you've got the bridging anaphora to the arbitrary car, and you've got this rhetorical relation of explanation uh, between three. By the way, these, the notes on which this is based, I'm very happy to make the file available, and, and if anybody wants to see more of this later, you can. So each of these four features depends on the assumption of the relevance of both B1, if the flight gets canceled, rent a car, and the whole of B2 with the dashboard and the radar detector to A's problem. And that's the problem we set up in the context. What's A's problem? A needs to get to San Francisco quick, and she's down in Los Angeles, which is at least a five-hour drive, okay? If you're quick. All right. So, the explanatory character of three is also understood on the assumption that it was intended to be relevant to that preceding discourse and the discussion of A's options, yeah? There's another way of saying this. The travel agent is committed to helping A choose the best course of action to permit A to achieve her goal of arriving in San Francisco by late afternoon. Um, in view of the potential impediment to this goal given by A, the flight potentially being canceled, the topic under discussion by B is clearly what to do in case the plane gets canceled. We're making plans, contingent plans, yeah? And that's made explicit in the antecedent of B1. The consequent of B2, B1 is the agent's central suggestion. The advice in B2, or B2, well, B2 is intended to address another potential impediment to the relatively smooth achievement of the goal, which would be getting stopped to have a ticket, give, be given a ticket, which is nasty in several respects, which the travel agent has the background information to foresee, as explained in three, okay? And B2 prime would be an alternative to B2. Okay, so you see the coherence of the discourse is all given by this goal that A has, potential impediments, B's commitment to helping A, A's commitment to achieving that goal, their mutual understanding of all this, and then a whole lot of implicit content introduced to help give coherence to that little discourse. You can do a lot of this sort of thing where you pile on all kinds of complex interactions between different aspects of content implicitly as a function of the goals, plans, and questions under discussion of interlocutors. That's actually my main point today, and then to think a little bit about what the implications of that are for a theory of context. So, 
um, both the subordination of the modal in uh, the modal subordination example B2 and the resolution of the bridging anaphora argue that context must be dynamic because there's no globally available, there's no, after the utterance of B1, there is no particular car, right? And um, we don't, there's no explicit indication with an if clause in B2 that we mean to relativize might to the circumstances of the flight cancellation and the car rental. Yeah, just to remind you what they're like. No indication explicitly of either of those things there. Yeah? Um, now, um, see, this kind of update is dynamic then because in the case of B2, when we, uh, when we introduce implicitly the car and the restriction on the domain, that licenses the use of that car as the antecedent to the dashboard, the implicit argument of the dashboard, okay? Now this kind of local update can be monotonic, and I've given you an example of that, and that's in two. A rented, A rented a car, and she might have had them install a radar detector. From outside the car, you couldn't see it on the dashboard. So here, I color-coded it, and we have, a con we have a conjunction instead of an implicit conditional, as we had in B2. Instead of, if the flight was canceled and A rented a car, she might have had them install a radar detector. Yeah? Yeah? But here, it's a conjunction, and because it's a conjunction, the first conjunct is actually referring to a particular car. We don't necessarily know which one it is. It's not specific in our information, but there's a particular car that she rented. Because of that, it's okay to say from outside the car. What car? The one she rented, right? The only salient actual car. You couldn't, you couldn't see it on, and again, it what? Um, the possibly rented dashboard, uh, uh, radar detector. And the dashboard, well, that would be the bridging an anaphora to the car. Got it? Okay. So all the same phenomena, except here, there's no implicit restriction of might, because the first conjunct is explicit, and um, it's a little more straightforward in some ways. But when the contributing update is conditional, so take a good look at two, because there we've got a conjunction. When it's conditional, as we saw in B, but I'll show you now what that means, then it, the update is non-monotonic. So after interpreting one, there's no car to refer to anaphorically in subsequent discourse. So here's a shortened version of one. If A rented a car, she might have had them install a radar detector. They put it on the dashboard. If I say they put it on the dashboard, how is the only way you can understand that? That, that I'm then assuming that she actually did, which is a kind of an odd thing to say after I, the speaker, just said they might have, she might have had them install a, a lie detect, radar detector. Yeah? Could be a generic. That's what they do. Not an explanation. Um, I don't understand. If you rent, if you rent a radar detector, that's where they put it. Oh, I would have to say they would put it on the dashboard. They would have put it on the dashboard. They would have had to put it on the dashboard, etc. I can't, I mean, personally, I'm not telling you what your uh, intuitions are, although I marked this as infelicitous with the crosshatch, just to make my point about my judgment. That's up to you. For me, without a modal to give the modal subordination interpretation, they put it on the dashboard is not felicitous for me, unless you take it that for some reason the same speaker has gotten over assuming that it was merely a possibility and has decided, or if it was another speaker. Maybe if we switch to another C here, then they say, oh yeah, she put it, they put it on the dashboard. Maybe C knows that A did get the radar uh, detector, okay? So that's the point to see, the difference between two where we have uh, conjunction, and so the, the update after you utter the first utterance is, that's a realis clause, and so the update is monotonic, yeah? It stays, versus in a conditional, like the first utterance in three or in B2, there's no in, uh, entailment uh, that after you, you've finished interpreting three, that there was a car or a, a, a radar detector, and that's why the anaphora's tricky. Okay? So that's the non-monotonicity of the uh, up 
temporary local update that you get in three. You have to have the update though, because if I didn't uh, contingent, I mean, hypothetically assume that A rented a car, I wouldn't have an antecedent for it or a dashboard, the dashboard, right? In B2. Okay, I hope that's clear. The intrusive implicature uh, that she rented a car to drive it to San Francisco in B1 shows us something else. We may draw non-explicit inferences which play into truth conditional content partly on the basis of merely local content in the same utterance. So I said, if the plane, the flight is canceled, rent a car. Right? So the plane flight being canceled is a crucial uh, 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 factor in the inference to be drawn that the rental of the car would be for the purpose of driving to San Francisco and achieving her goal despite the cancellation of the flight. Got it? So, um, the, the, um, we understand that the consequent of B1 is relevant to the antecedent just in case the rental offers a way to address the problem posed by the hypothetically canceled flight and the way it would do that would be for A to use the rented car to drive to her destination. So if this is correct, then merely local context, the context in the antecedent of a conditional that doesn't monotonically influence, directly influence uh, interpretation, um, if that non-monotonic local update then can play a crucial role in drawing an inference that contributes to the understood truth conditional content of the utterance as a whole. So this argues that icing on the cake is just off, okay? Um, and not all, uh, that not all such inferences, these local inferences, or sorry, implicative inferences are based on the proposition expressed by the utterance as a whole. So I wanted to go through that in some detail so that you could understand exactly the kinds of things that that, exam that example shows you. And there's a ton of other phenomena that we could set up in a very similar kind of context with these non-local contexts setting up resolution of some implicit phenomenon, ellipsis or something else, domain restriction, under the scope of the same operator, okay? Now let's look at a very different phenomenon, and the ones we've looked at are already very different. Intrusive implicature and an afro resolution. Prima facie, you wouldn't think those had much to do with each other, would you? I wouldn't have some years ago. So the one we're gonna look, here at, look at here is um, the question of whether presupposed content should project. Now what it means for content for, to project is that even when that content occurs, uh, is triggered by some expression, like a pronoun triggers an anaphoric presupposition, here we're gonna look at only, and it supposedly triggers the, the truth, the projection of the prejacent of only, I'll show you what that means in a moment, that that should uh, project means that when it occurs under the syntactic scope of an entailment canceling operator, and we'll show you these in four, uh, negation, interrogation, the antecedent of a conditional or under a modal, when it occurs under one of these entailment, uh, entailment canceling operators, if the content projects, the speaker still seems to be projected to, I mean, sorry, committed to that content. Whereas the regular asserted content, shall we call it, when it's under the scope of one of those operators, of course, it isn't, it's, it's, the entailment is canceled, right? Okay, so here's the standard tests for projection in all the linguistic literature. Um, the philosophical literature is still trying to catch up. They're kind of stuck back there on negation, but you'll get there, guys. Um, for A, from under the scope of negation, it's not the case that only Lucy came to the party. Now, just think for a second about what that means to you. No? If I said that to you, relatively out of the blue. Um, from under interrogation, did only Lucy come to the party? What's that mean? From the antecedent of a conditional, if only Lucy came to the party, it must have been pretty quiet. And from under the scope of a modal, maybe only Lucy came to the party. Yeah, okay. So who, when they hear those, takes the speaker to probably be committed to the proposition that Lucy came to the party? Some people are shy, but I see some tendencies in the room, okay? It's all right, have another cup of coffee. All the variants in four, for many speakers, 
By the way, if you put it in another context, it won't, so don't worry if it didn't for you. For many speakers, however, relatively out of the blue, all of those seem to implicate that Lucy came to the party. Again, I'm not committed to that, but that's what the classical literature said, by the way. Hence, five, did only Lucy come to the party? S said by the same speaker, follow up with, of course she didn't. Let's just think about it. If I, Craig, say to you, did only Lucy come to the party? Of course she didn't. Now, if the prejacent of only here, Lucy came to the party, projected, okay, then you could explain why it would be odd in Felicitas uh, to follow that up with Lucy didn't come. Because I somehow was committed by the first utterance to the assumption that Lucy came, and then I come right out and negate it. Yeah? So if that's at all odd for you, that suggests that at least in that kind of context, more or less out of the blue, it does tend to project. Yeah? I didn't hear you, sorry. Okay, that may be your story. I, I really don't object to that interpretation. Some people feel like that's a real contradiction in the sense that the first one commits them to coming. Again, it's not my analysis, so I'm not worried about it. But there's a tendency to interpret as projecting. That's really not my point. I just wanted to show you the phenomena. Good, good interjection. You get a similar phenomenon with possessive NPs and a variety of other purported presupposition triggers. So if I say to you, um, um, uh, sorry, I gotta run, I gotta pick my sister up at the dentist, okay? When you hear me say that, um, do you think I have a sister? Do you take me to have a sister? Or I could even say, oh, I'm not in a hurry, I don't have to pick my sister up uh, today. Okay, so there my sister seems to be under the scope of negation. Do you still think I have a sister? Probably so, right? So it is said by many that a possessive like my sister, at least with a definite uh, uh, possessive uh, NP, projects, that is to say, it presupposes the existence of the entity referred to. Um, notice, however, that the classical stories about presupposition, like the Stalmacarian one that I alluded to earlier, uh, try to account for that by saying that the common ground or the context, in order for an utterance with a presupposition to be felicitous, the common ground or the context in which it's uttered must entail the truth of the presupposed proposition. But you thought it was perfectly fine. You don't know me very well at all. I'm kind of a stranger and I say, oh, I can hang around and talk a little bit. I don't have to pick my sister up today. Okay? No problem and you figure I had a sister. You didn't know me before. That's not entailed by the context prior to utterance, yet it's fine. It does seem to project, but it's not so much presupposed as supposed, yeah? That is just backgrounded. So I'm gonna, I've argued before a long time ago that only the prejacent of only is more like the possessive noun phrase. It's really not so much presupposed in the classic Stalnikarian sense as it's backgrounded or supposed. It's not part of the foregrounded content that I'm asserting, and hence, foreground operators like negation, interrogation, et cetera, typically don't target that content, okay? There's more to it than this, but we don't have time to go into the whole big deal today, okay? Um, and it is okay, for novelty's sake, if A says in six, did Lucy come to the party? And B answers, actually only Lucy came. Will you take B here to be uh, uh, answering A's question? Yeah? So let's suggest that the, the, the prejacent is somehow part of the content of the utterance, only Lucy came. So you do take me to be, uh, B to be answering A's question. That's just that he says more than is required to answer the question. And that's another story. We don't have to go into that right now. So one of the ideas is that um, uh, if you have one of these supposed uh, contents, some of the supposed content, just a, a, an addressee who finds the prejacent of the question in four, the only prejacent, or that of B's answer in six, or the possessive in my sister, if, if they find that uncontroversial, 
the speaker will be inclined to accommodate the backgrounded presupposition, which just means act as if they knew it all along. It's not something for direct response, or, you know, unless you want to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't think you have a sister. You told me you were only child, yeah? But I can't just say that's false when I say I don't have to pick my sister up, meaning you don't have a sister, right? <laughs> okay, I have to sort of halt the progress of the conversation and say, hey, wait a minute, that, that assertion, that supposition you, you just made contradicts some information you gave me before. Okay? Okay, so we tend to take these things as accommodated if all other things are equal and it's not controversial or it doesn't matter to us whether it's true or not. But when it's pre controversial, the truth of the prejacent is itself the topic of discussion. Or, especially if the prejacent would contradict information in prior context, in any of those cases, the prejacent fails to project. That is, it's not automatically accommodated to the common ground. So in seven, contrary to what many may say, I found the level of violence high but not excessive. This isn't only a shoot 'em up pointless movie. There's more than just stage blood. Okay? Now here we got only. This is a naturally occurring example that David Bieber found in a web search. And here, it isn't only a shoot 'em up pointless movie has the prejacent, it's a shoot 'em up pointless movie. Is the speaker here committed to that prejacent? No. Okay? In fact, everything else he says about it suggests that he thinks it's not reducible. To, it isn't a shoot 'em up pointless movie, that there's more to it than that. Okay? So the prejacent doesn't always project. And here's another example I made up about a family where women generally have lots of kids. Amy says, how many kids does each of these siblings have? And Bruce says, Mary's the black sheep. As far as I know, she doesn't have any kids, but I can't remember for sure. Maybe she only has one kid? George, do you remember? Okay. So going right on to eight, the question of how many kids Mary has... Oh, yep. This isn't just a shoot 'em up pointless movie. There's more than just stage blood. I think that's better. Okay, but just suggests that the, the pre Jason of just, if we want to call it that, is true. Whereas only doesn't here for me. Yeah, is it also like it's just like only when it comes to presupposition projection or projection? I don't, I think it does okay. background the content. Uh, I haven't ever gone through the tests, and there's a lot of really subtle things to look at to see whether I think it's really presupposed. Okay, so I don't know. These things differ. I mean, I have, I'm working on a grant project with David Beaver, Mandy Simons, and Judith Tonhauser, where we're looking at differences between different uh, presupposition, supposed presupposition triggers, and there's lots of them, and they behave differently in different contexts. And that should tell us that it's not a uniform class and that they don't automatically project, so-called. Okay. okay, but going back to eight, um, the question is, Bruce is making a question, it's clear that for all he knows, Mary doesn't have any kids, and hence the prejacent, she has one kid in maybe, maybe she only has one kid. Here, look at it again. The prejacent. Um, doesn't project from under the modal in the third sentence. I'm basically just saying maybe she has one kid and no more than one kid. Because I've already said I don't know if she has any. Okay? To sharpen our grasp of the flexibility of the projected behavior of the prejacent, and see how it contrasts with that of the non-restrictive relative clause who has one kid in nine. Amy, how many kids does Mary have? George told me that Mary, who has one kid, is the black sheep of her family. She might not have any kids. Don't you think that the speaker, Bruce, has contradicted himself here? Yeah? Uh, I don't know, but, oh, I see. So you're saying that Bruce told me that Mary, who has one kid, it, you're saying that he's going to attribute the who, having one, who has one kid to George. Okay, if you do that, maybe he's not committed that, to that. But most people on first reading have taken this, and it's been claimed in the literature that that non-restrictive relative clause projects uh, without question. Okay, 
at least to the level of the person whose attitudes and beliefs it's anchored to. So if you take that to be something that um, is not being attributed to Bruce, then it has to project. Good observation. Okay? So the only reason for that being there is to contrast that with the lack of contradiction we feel. Um, I, uh, maybe she doesn't have any kids, maybe she only has one. No sense of contradiction or attributing the having one to somebody other than himself here on Bruce's part. So, conventional triggering of a presupposition of the prejacent of only would predict that it should always project, whereas in fact we have to abductively infer what the speaker must have meant by her utterance in context in order to determine whether she's committed to the truth of the prejacent. We can show that that local context can also have a bearing on projection, and here I have 10 where Amy is speaking to Betty, who went to dinner, a, a dinner party the night before with her friends Marcia and Lucy. Amy says, what did you all do after the dinner, the dinner party? And Betty says, we talked about going out to hit the bars, but in the end, I went home to nurse a cold. So if Marcia didn't go out, only Lucy did. Okay, what do you think? Does Betty mean to suggest that Lucy went to the bars? I'm getting a lot of nods, so a lot of people seem to think that it's projecting here. Again, I'm not trying to say that I have a theory that predicts that it will, just that it's backgrounded, and so it's not surprising if it does for you. Here, I think it tends to for a lot of people. So, compare 11, this with 11, uttered in the same context with the same three friends go to a dinner party the night before, Amy, Marcia, and Lucy. What did you all do after the dinner party? We talked about going out to hit the bars, but in the end, I went home to nurse a cold. Marcia usually only goes out if I did, so if anyone went out, only Lucy did. Does this seem to implicate that Lucy went to the bar in the same way that 10 did, if you thought 10 did? No. Why? Well, I have a little spiel here, and the story is the following. When you pose the antecedent of a conditional, this raises the issue of whether it's true or not. It actually raises up a partition over the set of all possible worlds into the ones in which uh, someone went out, and, or someone, anyone went out, and those in which they didn't, and asks you only to entertain those in which someone or other did. Yeah? One possible subcase of that is a case where Lucy did. But if we're, saying, if we're entertaining the possibility that anyone went out, we don't know whether Lucy went out. We also know that Marcia didn't, and, um, and, and, and with that, I'm sorry, that, Bet, that Betty didn't, and that Marcia was unlikely to. So effectively here, the only option left over, if anyone went out, is that Lucy went out, right? Hence, the consequent, the prejacent of the consequent, if Lucy went out, is under discussion, locally, merely locally, okay? And because of that, it fails to project. That is, it's as if to say, and this is related to this gentleman's comment on one of the earlier examples, if the antecedent of the conditional leaves open some question about the truth of the consequence, so it's in question, you're not gonna just project it automatically. Does that make sense to you? So here it's filtered out by the uncertainty in the local context in the if clause. So summarizing the linguistic evidence that we've looked at here, these argue against the classical answers to both the questions posed at the outset as well as against an extreme version of Ernie and Matthew's story. So instead, with respect to the character and role of context and in interpretation, question one, both the intrusive implicature in 1b1 and the subordination of the modal and resolution of the anaphora in 1b2 argue that context must be dynamic updated sometimes non-monotonically in the course of interpretation in order to address the ways that merely local context crucially contributes to a tested interpretation. In order to understand truth conditional content as truth conditional content which crucially includes non-explicit content that's arguably arrived at via inference. Yeah? And that then comes to bear on two with respect to the role of non-linguistic inferential processes in interpretation these intrusive implicatures show that inferences based in part on merely local contextual information play a crucial role in determining that truth conditional content so that truth conditional content cannot be captured by the icing on the cake approach 
And similarly, the projection of a prejacent of only is constrained not only by plausibility and what's under discussion globally, the big question, the problem we're all addressing in the overall discourse, but also why what's at issue locally, as in that conditional example that we just looked at. The topic of discussion may be a hypothetical possibility, as there, and this has a direct bearing on what's meant by the whole utterance, and in particular on whether backgrounded content will be understood to project. Okay? So here's a third, again, very different kind of pragmatic phenomena. These are, these are classics, folks. Conversational implicature, um, anaphora resolution, and uh, presupposition projection, all somehow constrained by what's at issue and the goals and plans of the interlocutors. Yeah. So, while one and two are both problems for the views of context and its role in interpretation of Kaplan, Stalnecker, and Grice, together they might be taken prima facie to support the Wild West approach. Hey, just draw the inferences you want all the time, no matter when. Yeah? But these examples that we've looked at display another feature that argues against that approach as well. In one, the fact that the interlocutors were jointly addressing the same problem, arguably dis uh, A, needing to get to San Francisco by late afternoon, arguably played a crucial role in drawing the intrusive implicature, which took the resolution of that problem to be the goal of the rental. And it also played into the assumption that B2 was modally subordinate to B1, etc. I'm not going to go through that slavishly because I've already done it, sort of. In other words, the central, the assumption that the interlocutors were cooperatively addressing the same problem is what makes this little discourse coherent and in turn plays a role in all the pragmatic phenomena observed there. Um, so, and then similarly, the projection of the prejacent of only at the bottom there is constrained not only by plausibility, but also by what's under discussion, not just globally, but locally in the antecedent of a conditional. So, in that case, the hypothetical possibility that's under discussion um, has a direct bearing on what's meant by the whole utterance and in, in turn can preclude projection, yeah, as we saw. So, um, that, that. okay, the common theme in all the examples that we looked at, um, so wait a minute, what did I got here? Okay, uh, a crucial factor was to uh, in, in the only cases in many of them was to target the question under discussion and this had a direct influence as I said. So this common theme is not a coincidental feature of the particular examples, few though they may be, that we looked at today. In a growing body of work since the early 1980s, Larry, uh, Larry Carlson, uh, Gross and Seidner, Jonathan Ginsberg, um, uh, von Kupeveldt, moi, and the growing body of work reflected in that nice online bibliography that keeps getting updated, so if you know something that's on there that I don't, tell me, because I want to add it, or have a slave add it. Okay, it has been argued that a central feature of the context of utterance is the way in which it's structured by the evident goals, plans, and intentions of the interlocutors, particularly these are, as these are reflected in the questions under discussion at that point. Okay, so here, very briefly, and I'm really only going to point at it because you can read the papers if you're interested. This is an advertisement for an approach to this general range of phenomena and a whole wide range of other things. Language is a game of collaborative inquiry structured by the recognized intentions of the interlocutors, and a discourse is one round of this game. Intentions involve commitments to goals. In the language game, players attend to two principal kinds of goals, domain goals, and the associated plans to achieve them are the things that interlocutors would, are publicly committed to achieving in the world and the strategies they adopt to do so. These are relevant in the language game insofar as they may indirectly motivate and constrain the interlocutor's linguistic interaction. Remember, meaning for Grice is intention recognition. This plays a direct role in that Gricean view. Discourse goals are a distinguished type of domain goal, and these Th those the interlocutors are jointly committed to achieving in the discourse itself. They're represented by questions, but a question is a semantic object. It's a set of propositions, the potential answers to the question, and the goal is to try to resolve the question, to use Jonathan's terminology, which means to give the complete full answer to the, to the question. Pick out which answer is the best correct one. So you can think of those as issues or topics under discussion. They're not interrogative sentences. 
and these two are organized in logically constrained ways to reflect an underlying plan, rational plan, for achieving those goals. You think of those rational plans as strategies of inquiry. So the main goal of any round of any game is to share information about the way things are. There are three kinds of moves. You can pose an interrogative. In other words, pose a question for discussion. That's a setup move. It's a proposal that we direct our attention to the resolution of that question. An assertion is a partial, at least a partial answer, ideally, to one of these questions. It's a payoff move. And a direction sets up a domain goal, something to do, not in the discourse itself, but in the world. Um, have a sandwich. Go in the world and have a sandwich. OK. So um, discourse has to be orderly. And in order to do that, the goals that we adopt or propose we adopt and the plans they form to achieve them must be consistent. And in particular, the discourse goals, the questions under discussion, should subserve pre-existing or overarching domain goals. So there's a tight logical constraint on the relationships between these different aspects of the context of utterance. Now, uh, if, you, if you stray off the topic, somebody can call you on that. This is something we all know about discourse and say, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Yeah, in English anyway. I don't know what you all say in French. OK, so the, this overall constrained relationship between the evident Domain goals and discourse goals in a context are what I call the intentional structure of the discourse. And because of these commitments to the goals and intentions of cooperative interlocutors, this tightly constrains the nature of relevant interaction in the discourse given those goals. Okay? That composes the intentional structure of the discourse. And rational cooperation, this Greisian idea, is just a realization of a constraint if you're a rational and cooperative interlocutor to make your utterance, which promotes your current intentions, your current goal. And in particular, if that goal is to address a question, give at least a partial answer to that question, or something that contextually entails a partial answer. Relevance consists in doing so. Whatever your move may be, even if it's uh, an imperative, uh, you say, where are my socks? And I say, look in the closet. That's relevant, just in case I have reason to think that if you look in the closet, you're likely to get at least a partial answer to the question of where your socks are. Huh? OK. So I'm not going to go further into the details of this. Here is a technical, a formal realization of the idea, the scoreboard for a language game. I use the scoreboard idea from Lewis, 79, but this is a very different scoreboard than the one that he proposed. I think it's in the same spirit in many ways. Some people take Lewis, Stalnecker, and um, the question under discussion to be incompatible frameworks. And I think, on the contrary, they are very compatible. OK, so you can go through that and look if you want to understand the logical constraints between the different aspects. But the important part is that we have, as part of the context of utterance, not only a, a common ground, a set of propositions as in Stalnecker, but a logically constrained set of questions under discussion. That's a push down store. And that's non-monotonic. Gets, questions get popped off when they get resolved or answered. And we have a set of evident goals, some for each of the interlocutors and some joint goals. They may then turn, be organized. They, some may subserve others. Some may form plans to achieve others. It's quite complex and interesting. And that bears on the interpretation of imperatives. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go into that in great detail, because I want you to think just a little more about what this says before I quit, about the um, why intention and this intentional structure matter to interpretation. I'm going to claim that why we should think this place, well, I mean, if, let's assume that I'm right and other people are right. And there are a wide range of uh, uh, pragmatic phenomena which uh, this question under discussion bears on, not just the ones I told you about today, but speech act resolution and prosodic focus and its interpretation and just a whole range of other things that are prima facie completely unrelated. Why should this question under discussion, with elliptical utterances and non-sentential um, utterances, why should all these things be constrained in their interpretation and frequently the resolution suggested by the question under discussion and the domain goals? Okay. I'm saying it, that these joint goals, and that's what all of that intentional structure is, whoopsie, these joint goals establish top-down expectations 
top-down expectations play a role in what we expect our speaker to be talking about. And among other things, for example, as you see in eye tracking experiments and psycholinguistics and later in this handout or the associated paper, long list of relevant eye tracking experiments about an afro resolution. And they can show with eye tracking that given a domain in a visual array and the expectation that the speaker, the experimenter, is going to refer to something, certain issues about what's under discussion will restrict that domain, visual domain, in such a way that at most one or two or three things on the array will be attended to by the addressee before they hear the target referential expression so that when they hear it and the beginning of it dis disambiguates not among all the things on the array but among the two or three things that are relevant to the question or the other goal, there's no disambiguation because it's the only one who's where the descriptive content of the anaphoric trigger fits the entity that's the intended referent. So this is the kind of case where Matthew and Ernie, I think, are right. It's not that relevance always is about doing uh, uh, inferences in order to determine plausibly which of the, all the many things on this visual array the speaker might have had in mind to refer to. Instead, we have this top-down expectation on the basis of what's under discussion of what limited range of things are really relevant in that potential referential domain. And that, that top-down domain restriction gives you a very quick, almost automatic resolution of the anaphora without any ambiguity. No reasoning required. In this case, I would say that that's a function of Gricean relevance, but it's not that there's reasoning involved. You understand the difference. It's that relevance to the question or discussion of the goal, the set of relevant alternatives, yields the intended referent readily. So that's the kind of case where I think Matthew and Ernie are onto something. Not all these things are about making inferences, drawing inferences, and the eye tracking work shows you that. There's no time for people to draw the references, inferences before they uh, lock, on, lock on to the intended referent. There's other literature that I'm referring to here where I um, talk about this general phenomenon in vision of inattentional blindness. Highly recommend that literature to your uh, attention, where whatever you're attending to will tend to mask out those things in your larger domain that aren't relevant. So you know the story, you've seen the video? Can I tell them about the video and then we'll stop? Chablis and, what's his name? Simons and Chablis did this great experiment. They had a bunch of like eight young graduate students in white outfits passing a, a black ball or white ball, I think it was a white ball. White ball on the video and you're the subject and you're supposed to watch the video and try to count the number of times they pass the ball. And they're doing it very quickly, you know, and they're, they're faking so you have to really watch. It's like a shell game and see how many times did they actually pass it, yeah? You're watching that like crazy. The video is only a couple of minutes long or something like that. They say, how many times did he pass it? I can't remember. I'll let you watch and see if you can count. OK, not easy. And then they, you know, they tell you the answer. And they say, oh, by the way, did you see the gorilla? It turns out, I show you again in slow motion, in the middle of this crazy play, a big guy in a black gorilla suit and mask comes out in the middle. These people are going all around him. They're ignoring him. And he goes, Ooh, and he walks off. Slowly. Most people don't notice him. This is a famous experiment because a shockingly large number of people don't notice the gorilla. That's inattentional blindness. You're not paying attention to that. It's irrelevant to your task. All you're no trying to notice is the number of times the ball gets passed. That's what I'm talking about when I say that the intentional structure of discourse plays an extremely important role, rather in the linguistic interpretive domain like inattentional blindness in the visual domain. And I have a lot of nice literature here that you might want to look at that suggests that there are concurrent processes in visual processing. You get a bottom-up, percept-driven uh, uh, pre-parse of the visual scene, identification of what's in it and where it is. But you get concurrent, top-down constraints and expectations 
based in part on task and what you think is going to happen, what you expect, and you won't even notice the things that aren't relevant to what you expect in a large percent of cases. How is that different from what we saw in the eye tracking experiments? Very similar. And there's evidence that in linguistic processing there are such dual processes. So, to me, this suggests, and I'll stop now, that these experimental work supports the idea that we were just looking at, that, that processing is dynamic, context update is dynamic, not necessarily monotonic, and that that crucially plays a role in some cases in the kind of pragmatic reasoning that Grice was interested in. <laughs>